just like the chancellor, Tennessee's athletic director said, <laughs> not in my house. Plus, an offensive lineman, a current offensive lineman, does something drastic. Got a fun show here on a Friday, the latest in Tennessee against the NCAA. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good Friday morning, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Balls. I am Eric Kane. Glad to have you here on your commute to work. While you're in that treadmill, that cubicle, while you're running, while you're working out, whatever the case may be, getting your weekend started with us here on Lockdown Vols. Can't thank you enough for that. Shout out FanDuel. Make every moment more with FanDuel Sportsbook, especially this weekend with the big game coming up on Sunday. Or actually, that's <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Off week. Got the, got the big Pro Bowl games. That's lame, I know. But the uh, Super Bowl 58 is coming up next weekend. And uh, no better time to uh, put some coin in your pocket than over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Um, yeah, we got a whole lot to get into today. So uh, shout out every day or so we'll go ahead and get into it. Danny White, Tennessee's athletic director, uh, just like D Chancellor Donda Plowman, like, hey, not in my house. No, we're not going to do this here at Tennessee. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to shove it right back in in your face if you're the NCAA. And that's pretty much what Danny White said on Thursday when he released a statement. If you remember, there's a timeline here, okay? He had Tuesday the initial report from Sports Illustrated that Tennessee was under another investigation. Tennessee confirmed that. Um, we've talked about it all week long. You had Don De Plowman who came out later that day and released a three-letter, or it was obtained, it was a three-page uh, letter to NCAA President Charlie Baker where she went scorched earth, okay? You had uh, the Tennessee Attorney General and Virginia Attorney General uh, filing a lawsuit against the NCAA. You had Governor Bill Lee speak out on behalf of Tennessee. You've had... Um, Senator Marsha Blackburn speak out on behalf of Tennessee. You've got, um, just, I mean, I'm forgetting all this. Tom Mars, who's representing Spire Sports Group, has uh, released a statement. And um, there's there's been a lot going on. The NCAA retaliated, not retaliated, but responded, issued its own statement yesterday, which we talked about on the show. And that brings us to Thursday afternoon when Danny White releases his own statements. All right. He says, the NCAA, and then the next couple of words are bold and italicized, generally does not comment on infraction cases because there's a rule against it. However, that has not stopped them in the past from leaking information to the media as they did this week about us. Again, I said on yesterday's show that I've been told, and I believe, that the NCAA leaked all that, that plane and the Nico stuff to the New York Times. The NCAA leaked it out there, and that's pretty much what Danny White's saying right here. He said their actions made this ill-conceived investigation public and forced us to defend ourselves. He goes on to say, it is clear that the NCAA staff does not understand what is happening at the campus level all over the country in the NIL space. After reviewing thousands of Tennessee coach and personnel phone records, NCAA investigators didn't find a single NIL violation, so they moved the goalpost. They moved the goalpost to fit a predetermined outcome. They are stating that the, uh, that the, uh, NIL guidelines, the contradictory, uh, conject God, I can't say that word, uh, contradictory, there we go, NIL guidelines, which he puts in parentheses, written by the NCAA, not the membership, doesn't matter, and applying the old booster bylaws to collectives. If that's the case, then 100% of major programs in college athletics have significant violations. This is obviously silly and not productive, as is blaming membership whenever they are challenged. We need to be spending our time and energy on solutions to better organize college athletics in the NIL era, something the NCAA leadership failed to do back in 2021. Student athletes, prospective student athletes, coaches, and administrators across the country deserve better. And I refuse to allow the NCAA to irrationally use Tennessee as an example for their own agenda. End quote. Again, it wasn't three pages. It wasn't as detailed scorched earth as what Don DePlowman did earlier this week, but Danny White, he ain't, he ain't having none of this. Uh, that last line again, let's revisit it. I refuse to allow the NCAA to irrationally use Tennessee as an example for their own agenda. Man, man oh man, oh man. I think I know how this is going to end. I mean, the NCAA, if this actually makes it to court, the NCAA is going to lose. 
But the NCAA, as you'll hear from Pete Nakos of On3 on the J.D. Piquel show uh, here in segment number two, they're already fighting like four, five, six court battles right now. And they're going to be stacking L's upon L's upon L's, and it's truly going to be the demise of the NCAA. Um, man, this is uh, this, this is something. Danny White, of course, getting in good, uh, good favors from Tennessee fans, kind of coming to his aid. And on social media, you saw all that on uh, on a Thursday afternoon, and it was good to see. And I mean, look at how organized Tennessee is. I mean, just so organized. You and again, this is. This did not catch them off guard on Tuesday when the SI released that that report, right? I mean, they, they've been on campus. They they know that they've been on campus. Um, you've got you've got Donna Plowman with a three page letter ready to roll. Okay, you have uh, you have Tom Mars who's representing Spire with a ready to go statement. You have Bill Lee with a ready to go statement. You, I mean, you have all these things that kind of come one after another after another. Look at how well organized Tennessee is right now. Tennessee looks in control, and despite there being rivalries and college football fan bases across America that might not like Tennessee, I, I think you know whether they want to admit it or not. Right now, this week, they've kind of been you know rooting on and enjoying seeing not only enjoying seeing the cloud over Tennessee's program, but the way Tennessee is fighting back. Because, as Danny White said, "quote Then 100% of major programs in college athletics have significant violations." There's skeletons buried in every single program around the country. I'm going to tell you that in the NIL space. Because why? Well, because the NCAA is moving the goalpost. This is as simple as I said earlier this week. The NCAA is going after Spire. This The NCAA is going after Spire because Spire has gotten so much publicity for the good work that it's done, being out in the front of the NIL space, having over 4,000 members, a member at one point in time, maybe still in all 50 states. And of course, the the, the big uh, rumor, name, image, likeness deal for Nico Iamaliaba. This is simply the NCAA going after Spire. That's all it is. And they're trying to make an example out of Tennessee, but Danny, Wise, Danny White says, you are not going to make an example out of Tennessee, not on my watch. So things are heating up. As I said yesterday, the block thickens, and uh, we'll see what happens. Also, also on Thursday, you have a current Tennessee offensive lineman, senior Jackson Lampley has filed a declaration in, in, in the NCAA NIL lawsuit on behalf of Tennessee in support of Tennessee, essentially saying it was a six-page statement uh, that was obtained first, and I got the news from Knox News, um, Adam Sparks, who was on the show yesterday, essentially saying, hey, I'm ready to go and testify. If they need me, call me. I can, I can do it. And he released a six-page statement talking about his experiences as a collegiate athlete coming in, being recruited prior to, to the NIL space in 2019, being here when NIL was instituted, and now on the back end of his career, he's about to be a super senior six year, talking about when he uh, hosts guys on recruiting visits or anything, and he talks to uh, prospective student athletes, the first thing they ask for is, what's the NIL package looking like? Um, can it benefit me to come here? Um, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast right now, and that's what Jackson Lampley have called upon will be testifying to saying, I mean, that that's where, that's where you are. That's where, that's where it is. Um, that just kind of is what it is right now. And so, uh, Jackson Lampley getting involved and he talk about the ultimate team player. I mean, he got a guy that's about to be a super senior in-state kid. He's a, he's a legacy. His dad played at Tennessee. Okay. He's never been a routine starter. Every day starter, but he's filled in. He's made a couple starts throughout his career, uh, against Vanderbilt in the regular season this past year and in the citrus bowl. Um, kind of does whatever the team asks him to do. And I'm not saying the team asked him to do this, but like this is just another example of like being an ultimate team player. So um will be interesting if, if he is uh, called to testify, he'll be a very interesting case study a little bit because again, was was in college before NIL when NIL happened and now seeing the effects in recruiting and, and how it's changed recruiting instead of just being, well, I like the coaches. I like the university. I like the city. I like the program. I like the scheme. I like the NFL outlet, I like development. It's all that still is what Jackson Lampley wrote about in a six page statement, but it's also what's that package look like? What's that NIL, pa NIL package look like? So again, we just continue to go day by day and something new happens and something new happens and something new happens uh, here on a Friday. Something might happen, you know, over the weekend, whatever the case is, We'll continue to break it down all right here on uh, Locked On Vols as we uh, as we continue on here. I mean, it's um, 
Never a dull moment on Rocky Top. That is for dang sure. Never a dull moment. And uh, we'll talk it all right here on the show. And when we come back from earlier this week on the J.D. Piquel show, or it's the, uh, the hard count with J.D. Piquel of On3, Pete Nakos, another On3 personality, covers the uh, transfer portal, co- covers name, image, and likeness, has a legal background. He joined J.D. and had some interesting stuff to say. We're going to hear from uh, Pete Nakos in a moment when we return right here on Lockdown Balls. Happy Super Bowl week to all that celebrates. It's officially going to be the Super Bowl week here the first of next week. It's America's number one sports book. If you're like me, man, the Super Bowl is so much fun. Sit on the couch, fellowship with some friends, some family, eat those pigs in a blanket, eat uh, chips and dip, some pizza, some wings, have some beer, whatever the case may be. I love football, but it's an event. I mean, it is. Halftime show. You got the commercials and all that. It's a time for a lot of people to come together that might not normally come together, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and FanDuel is a way that you can end, is giving you the option to end the season on a W as well. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three Ws. Um, not only can you bet on who's going to win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has the bets for which players will score a touchdown, um, how many points will be scored, individual player props such as uh, first reception, first rushing yard, first... Um, First, first down, you know, whatever the case may be, plus the totals, the spreads, all that and more, you can find at FanDuel Sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to sign up. New customers can join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. That's at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It's a, the official sports partner of the NFL. All right, we continue on here with the Friday edition of Lockdown Vols. We got Grant Ramey of uh, Vol Quest on three coming on to talk a little of the investigation and more hoops getting Tennessee, uh, g- giving you a preview for Tennessee and Kentucky. That's coming up here in segment number three. Uh, but as I mentioned, I did want to get into a brief conversation. I, I took part of this interview. You can go uh, check out the hard count on the on three YouTube channel and see the entire interview. But I wanted to play some of the interview, about five minutes, and just kind of talking about what this means for the NCAA. And what this means for Tennessee in the immediate. This is J.D. Piquel. He's the host. Pete Nakos, who covers NIL, Transfer Portal, has a legal background here with On3. Give this a listen. Some really, really good stuff on if you're picking a fight, you can't win if you're the NCAA. So what could be like the the fallout from this? Let's just go ahead and say that Tennessee and Virginia walk in there, wipe the floor with the NCAA. Does this lead to like a ripple effect of more change on the NIL landscape? Or what, what, what what can we see happening here, Pete? I mean, let's put it bluntly. If the, if Tennessee and Virginia wins this, it means the NCAA can no longer oversee college sports and NIL enforcement. And all of a sudden, we're having conversations about what is there amateurism anymore? Does the NCAA exist? Um, the NCAA is already being pressed in another court case about its transfer portal rule. So if they lose that and they lose this, all of a sudden uh, college sports is officially off to the races and the NCAA is out of the picture. Wow. So this so this is kind of like this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back is what you're saying. Like this could be the thing that sets the NCAA apart from college sports. And would that be college sports as a whole? Would that be just college football or like how could that play out here going forward? Well, I mean, obviously it'd be all of college sports. But when we talk about the big NIL deals and the big transfer portal movement, we're talking about college football, college basketball, college baseball, women's basketball. Um, but, man, this has been building, right? Like the NCAA. The, NIL started July 1, 2021, and for the last two and a half years and change, the NCAA has done everything it possibly can to avoid this exact kind of lawsuit, and now it is in this lawsuit, and we're going to find out what the NCAA can really push back on and, and have the court system views the NCAA. And the other thing to mention, and J.D., let's get in the weeds real quick here, right? So we talk about antitrust laws. This is basically like – the federal government overseeing monopolies and things of that sort. The NCAA has been hoping to get this antitrust exemption for years, and they haven't. And and now this is all going to be put to the test in the courts. And a lot of us, I think, the like as soon as we saw that there was smoke between the NCAA and Tennessee, like the most high-profile NIL individual you would imagine is Nico Iamaliava by nature of all the rumors around him potentially being like the $8 million recruit and all that. And then Spire Sports puts out a statement basically from what I could tell saying like, hey, listen, we did everything well above board. 
the, there's nothing shady going yep. on here. Like, don't don't look at us. Basically, is it fair to assume that like the whole Nico Iamaliava and and the smoke around the NIL dollars he's collecting is a, a catalyst to this whole investigation and what, what's happening? Or how much of a role was the Nico Iamaliava NIL smoke to this whole investigation in your mind? Yeah. So they're tied together at the hip, right? So while I say the lawsuit has come together over time, uh, they're coordinated. I mean, they have to do with each other. Um, and, ju- and, and obviously what the uh, state attorney generals are challenging here is that the NCAA cannot um, prohibit recruits from coordinating with NIL collectives and signing deals before they arrive on campus, right? And that's exactly what Nico did here. And that's why that we're in the situation we're in now where the NCAA has sent its enforcement team into Knoxville um, and obviously looking into this. And while everyone has kind of circled around the contract, J.D., the other thing that's interesting and worth mentioning that the New York Times reported on Tuesday was um, that this booster funded uh, NIL collective, right, Spire Sports, um, there's there's the NCAA is looking into them possibly flying Nico from California to Knoxville on a private jet as a recruit. And I think that is maybe the center of the NCAA investigation more so than this contract that everyone loves to talk about. P, I, I see that and I, and I hear things like that. And my, my first thought is, and maybe I'm just naive to this whole thing, but like my first thought is, isn't everybody doing things of that nature? Like, like the, my thought yeah. is it's not Tennessee versus NCAA. It's like college football versus NCAA. Tennessee is just kind of the representative here. Uh, spot on. And there's been a lot of uh, fun tweets this morning um, that have really gotten to the point of maybe that the NCAA has uh, come on a little stronger than they maybe should have. And, and I mean, man, Tennessee is one of the top athletic departments in the country. Um, they're, they're so well coordinated. This uh, this lawsuit comes out this morning, JD, and like you have the governor like vouching for it. Uh, you have like it, it's just so well coordinated. And at the end of the day, I mean, I think the NCAA is definitely in a really tough spot right now. I was going to say, like, what cards do they they even hold in this whole situation? Like, if I'm the NCAA, you're trying to refer to like old laws or old rules that were in place or like the ever changing structure. Like, what, what can the NCAA do here, Pete? they're obviously going to fight back in the courtroom, but man, like they have like six court battles they're fighting right now. I mean, it's just like a quick rundown. If they lose any of these, like you could be looking at athletes being classified as employees. You could look at revenue sharing. You could look at unionization. And I mean, obviously the NCAA has been hoping to go to Congress, right. To get this all fixed. So they don't have to lose the courtroom battles, but Congress ain't moving, man. I mean, this is, this is officially the tipping point of college sports. Officially, the tipping points of college sports. What could happen? Who could follow? I'm still waiting. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out why Florida has not, the Florida uh, Attorney General's office has not, you know, jumped in this lawsuit. Um, I would expect that to happen because, again, the NCAA is currently already dealt out punishments of Florida State. It's under investigation of Florida. It's poking around Miami. And as we continue to say throughout the week, um, there's going to be more teams from the SEC and in college football that the NCAA is going to, that is currently investigation. And of course, we'll see what comes of it with some notice of allegations. So it's been a wild week. It's been a really, really wild week. And uh, it's been a, a story that continues to develop and, and, fall, and um, you know, change throughout the week. And with more and more people kind of giving their inputs and their statements. And um, all I can say is buckle up. Um, you know, volunteer, right? You got the nickname, you're the, the volunteers. Well, Tennessee didn't volunteer for this. But Tennessee could be at the forefront of maybe the demise of the NCAA, depending on how all this plays out. But again, at the end of this week, I'll continue to reiterate, and things can always change. In terms of the short term, yes, cloud over, recruiting, negative recruiting. It's it's going to affect recruiting. It, it's uh, That's unfortunate. But in terms of being able to compete for championships in 2024, just as Trey Wallace said, um on and i don't think i included it in the show yesterday but i do have the full interview it's uh it's available wherever you get you down to your your podcast um just like trey wallace said in, in that full interview you know if, if they tried to say nico or anybody else would be ineligible for next season i mean you file an injunction you you file all this stuff and, and you continue to push it out and it wouldn't even be resolved until nico and or player is in the NFL or gone, you know, like you can continue to push and push and push and push this. So um, in the, in the immediate near future, I don't, I don't see any issues for the 2024 season. And that's kind of the big thing I've been 
searching for this week is, yes, I know what this is. I know what this could be. But how does this affect the now? How does this affect Tennessee's ability to try to compete to go to Atlanta for an SEC championship or compete in the first year of the college football playoffs, 12-team college football playoffs? So I don't think it's going to. But again, you know, we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor this and uh, see what's in store the rest uh, over the next couple of weeks. Again, as of Thursday, as of the time of this recording, Tennessee has not received its notice of allegations from the incident of lay. When it does, we'll break it down. All right, here on Lockdown Vols. Hey, when we get back, we, uh, we're we going to take a short little break here. We're breather. When we get back, Grant Ramey of VolQuest.com is going to comment on all this, but also get you set for Tennessee at Kentucky in Rupp Arena. Tennessee Hoots back in action coming off a, a loss to South Carolina. That's coming up next right here on Lockdown Vols. All right, we're going to conclude a Friday edition of Locked On Vols here, bringing on my co-worker, Grant Ramey, VolQuest.com. A lot going on uh, with Tennessee this week. We're going to talk hoops uh, with Grant. Big matchup at Rupp Arena. But first, I kind of want to get your thoughts on everything that's happened this week. Grant, Tennessee, uh, instead of lay investigation, um, Danny White speaks out on Thursday. You got the joint lawsuit from Tennessee and Virginia. You got Donda Plowman going scorched earth. You got senators talking. You got governors talking. What's your take on all this? Uh, just another quiet week in Knoxville. Just kind of par for the course. Just kind of yeah. what we're used to after the last X number of years. I, I mean, I don't. It feels like Tennessee was prepared for this um, and prepared to come out guns blazing and and with you know um, the attorney general and all that stuff and the statement that Donde put out, the statement that uh, Danny White put out Thursday, talking about the NCAA agenda. He's not going to let be, Tennessee be used or fall victim to this agenda that the NCAA is pushing. Uh, it's crazy to see them come out with this type of force. I mean, what we what we got used to the last couple of years was co- cooperating fully and saying, yeah, this happened. We fired everybody. You know, come you're, come investigate what went on. You're, you're welcome on the campus. We'll help you out. We'll do whatever we can to take part in this investigation. And now it's like full bore. And I don't really blame them because it feels like the NCAA is trying to go back and retroactively regulate something that uh, wasn't previously regulated, and that's really hard to do. It just doesn't seem fair to Tennessee. It doesn't seem fair to anybody else in college athletics. I think that's why Tennessee's fighting this so hard. I think that's why um, other people are, are agreeing with the way they're fighting this thing. So, again, I know you don't have the answer to this, but I've kind of been asking everybody I've talked to this week, what's going to come of this, man? Um, in the short term for Tennessee, 2024, do you see anything happening uh, in terms of maybe eligibility with Nico Imaliava or – you know, whatever the case may be. And then long-term, do you think that potentially, I mean, it all depends on if other states kind of jump on board. What's, you know, Tennessee kind of leading this movement here against uh, to, to, to end the NCAA? I mean, for Tennessee to come out this strongly and, and, and put out these kind of statements with this kind of verbiage, it, it leads me to believe that they think they're completely in the clear and they shouldn't be punished. And if that's the case, then I don't sit anybody. I don't worry about eligibility because I feel like I didn't do anything wrong. Um, if Tennessee do, if the NCAA does, whenever the time comes, find that Tennessee did something wrong, it feels like you could go to any school in the country, any football program in the country that's using NIL and go after them the same way that they're going after Tennessee right now and, and trying to, like I said, go back and, and say you broke rules that didn't exist when at the time that this was going on. So I, I, it's long overdue that the that major uh, college football breaks away from the NCAA and does their own thing. Uh, college football playoff has nothing to do with the NCAA. That's why you don't see their logos on the field, on the signage, on the trophies, anything like that already. Their postseason has nothing to do with the NCAA. It's far beyond time for FBS or whatever to break off and do their own thing and regulate themselves and leave the NCAA behind because whatever's going on here, it's it's kind of a perfect example of the NCAA didn't have their arms around this to start with. Now they're trying to get their arms around it at the expense of a school, and it feels like if if they could do this to Tennessee, they could do it to anybody in the country. And if that's the case, everybody else is going to be ready to get out the door too. Should be interesting. Of course, we'll see what those notice of allegations look like for Tennessee. We've done the song and dance uh, here lately. So uh, at least Tennessee fans are kind of prepared. The coaching staff's prepared and kind of how to navigate through these waters and recruiting and all that. And then you know, Tennessee won a whole lot of games uh, while under investigation the last couple of years. So um, in the meantime, we'll see what happens. Let's go to Tennessee basketball right now. Coming off a uh, disappointing loss to uh, South Carolina. This kind of got a couple of sneaky, nice little wins on the season. One to Tennessee, of course, the other night. Don't connect. A quiet, quiet 31 points. Much different from his 
30 burgers that he's put up already this year. He was struggling for much of the game, uh, but went on a run there at the very end, scored the last 13 points for Tennessee. Um, but it wasn't enough. It was Dalton, and it was pretty much nobody else. What needs to happen for Tennessee to win a rivalry game on the road against Kentucky? Well, here's Kentucky in a nutshell. They are elite offensively, and they don't seem to care that much about playing defense. So Tennessee's going to, A, have to score points or up They're going to have to hit shots. It's going to have to be guys not named Dalton Connect that are hitting shots. You know, At this point, it feels like you know what you're going to get from Dalton. Zakai Ziegler can't go 0 for 6 from the field. Jonas Adu can't go 2 for 8 from the field. They can't go 8 for 20 on layups. Uh, they can't have J.P. Estrella miss a two-hand dunk, point blank, staring at the rim. Um, you know, Josiah Jordan-James got hit a shot at some point. Jordan Ganey off the bench. Uh, you need him to, to give some production. They're going to play defense, and they're going to try to slow down Kentucky, and it's going to be hard to keep them under whatever, 70. But at the same time, you're going to have to score. And I don't think I would call it a disappointing loss to South Carolina. I think I would call it brutal. Uh, that hurts. You, you can't lose home games. South Carolina's tough. They did a great job winning that basketball game and, and breaking it up into segments and, and playing those segments out. Tennessee's got to be way better. They, they can't – sit around and wait for Dalton to go off. Dalton didn't hit a shot from the field the first 17 minutes of the second half, and it felt like nobody else around him knew what to do because he wasn't making the shots. I mean, we were talking to them Saturday night at Vanderbilt, like, are y'all better and play looser when Dalton starts making shots and scoring? And I think the, the answer was basically yes, but it felt like when he wasn't scoring in South Carolina or he wasn't making shots from the field, they kind of tightened up, and they can't do that. They're, they're too good of an offensive team to score 59 points. I know you, you don't cover Kentucky basketball on a daily basis. I know you're not in that that locker room, but um, some, some injury concerns a little bit heading into this game for Kentucky. I'm going to ask you anyway because I know you're good at your job. Um, what, what's kind of that injury situation look like for Kentucky and potentially uh, will those guys you know, will play a role against Tennessee? Uh, Rob Dillingham was injured, I believe, Wednesday night against Florida. They lost at home too. Uh, another crazy one. Uh, talk about bad weeks for Tennessee and Kentucky. Kentucky was up four with under 20 seconds left, and they found a way to lose to Florida in overtime, and, and that's tough to do and gave up 90-something points in the process at home. So, And there was another injury uh, to one of the Kentucky forwards. He, he left the game, went to the locker room, and later came back to the game. So uh, I don't know how much of a concern there is there. I'm not sure how much Rob Dillingham is a concern either. But they did play overtime the other night and played a ton of minutes, and I don't know how deep their rotation is. But it's a Kentucky team that's not all that interested or doesn't seem all that interested in playing defense. They're going to put up a lot of points. Tennessee's going to have to go up there and they're going to hit shots. They're going to hit shots early. They can't start over whatever from the field seven like they did against South Carolina and dig a seven-point hole and hope to crawl out of it, especially on the road uh, in an arena that's going to be full. And that Tennessee-Kentucky rivalry is always intense atmosphere. So regardless of whoever's available, they better go up there and they better hit shots and score some points. Lastly, talk to me about uh, Josiah Jordan-James, man. Arguably playing some of his best basketball to begin the season. Not so much here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, he's affecting the basketball. He's affecting the game in other areas, assists, rebounds. Uh, for the most part, his plus minus is always you know, pretty, pretty good. He's playing 30 minutes a game, 28 minutes a game. Uh, but it looks like he's lacking some, some confidence on the offensive end, not shooting an awful lot. Um, and if Tennessee, obviously... You know, wants to go and make a deep tournament run, so you know, he's going to have to shoot the ball more. He doesn't have to be the guy, but he's got to be better offensively than what he's been. I mean, he can be the guy. He he scored twenty three against North Carolina State in December. If you remember that game, Dalton Connect scored mm -hmm. two points, and it was like he wasn't even on the floor. That's that's what Josiah is capable of, and I think he'll get back to some version of that. Tennessee doesn't need him to take 10, 12 shots a game. They need to take they need him to take more than two or three though. And they need him to hit some shots. They need some production out of him. Yes, he does affect winning. Uh, he's good defensively. He's versatile defensively. Uh, he's versatile offensively in terms of rebound, in terms of rebounding the basketball, assist, all that stuff. He's a smart guy. Knows how to play the game. I think it feels kind of like Jordan Ganey did for a few weeks. Where man, if he could just see one go in, maybe that would build some confidence. I think he did that against Florida, Josiah. That is a couple weeks ago, and then he didn't take a didn't take any more shots the rest of the game. I think he's got to be a little bit more aggressive. So they don't need him to be what he's tried to be in the past because they got Dalton here to score the points, uh, to score a lot more points than he's been used to in the past few seasons. And everything goes through him. They just need him to hit open shots when they're there, shoot it confidently. I do think that's an issue. I don't, he's had a rip uh, wrist taped, his left wrist, and now it's kind of extended to his thumb. I don't know if that's a deal. Um, he's probably going to get asked to Rick Barnes at some point soon uh, if that's something that's slowing him down. But He's got to be able to hit some shots for him here and there and, and, and shoot it confidently. And uh, maybe if he makes one, makes two, maybe he can get back to being that guy. 
a lot. I'm going to stop saying one more because I always have one more after that when I talk to people. Um, out the door is this team right now. I asked this to Steve Hamer um, last week on the radio, but is this team at this stage of the season better about what you thought or worse than kind of what you envisioned coming into the regular season? Better. Um, there's a bad taste in your mouth because you scored 59 points against South Carolina and it looked like some of the offensive old where they struggled to score. They didn't make a shot from the field for like 17 minutes in the second half. It was insane. Some of the shots they were missing. Um, but they have been consistently better offensively. They got as high as number 18 in adjusted offensive efficiency in Ken Palm. Uh, past teams were like in the 60s, 50s, maybe 30 at best. So they're a lot better offensively, and they have been that consistently more so than I thought. Dalton's obviously way more than I thought. I thought he was a good basketball player. I didn't think he was going to be this guy. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to be concerned about the offense. And It, it could just be one bad day. You don't want to see that in a home game. Um, but unless those games start to pile up, then you become concerned. But on top of the increased offensive numbers, they're just the same team as same team defensively. I mean, they're still number two in adjusted defensive efficiency. They haven't given up anything on the defensive end while adding the offensive pieces. So uh, they're better than what I expected because they score it better than I expected and more consistently. And and they got to get back to doing that. Grant, appreciate the time, man. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll all be following your work tomorrow night at Kentucky, Tennessee, and the Wildcats, 830 at Rupp Arena. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, that is Grant Ramey, VolQuest.com. Big thank you, as always, for tuning in and listening to Locked On Vols, watching Locked On Vols. Uh, free download wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe and watch on the YouTube channel. It's been a wild week, and I'm expecting it to be a wild weekend. More and more people will talk. More and more statements will be issued. We'll see if Tennessee gets that notice of allegations. I still think it'll be within the next two weeks, but we will see, and we'll cover it all right here on Locked On Balls. Until then, enjoy the weekend, stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you again on Monday.